Thank you, Jörg, for inviting me to come here and speak about a little bar in Barcelona. I'm really excited, and this turnout of people is amazing in the short time that you guys created this. Um, I want to. I want to start off today just by speaking a little bit uh, about myself and where I come from uh, with a very, very narrow focus on the entrepreneurial side of thinking about bars. And after that, I want to speak about a couple of points that throughout my research, throughout what I was reading about and studying when we were going to open the bar, I thought that these different points helped me a lot. Uh, not all of them are necessarily my own opinion and points, but they're gathered and I, from me, and I think that I can definitely share with you the, the, the different authors from uh, who have written about these different things, about running different businesses. Um, so my name is Mo, Mo Aljaf. I'm raised in Sweden. I, uh, my family's Middle Eastern from Iraq. And I left Sweden as soon as I could because I didn't really like it there. I left it at the age of 18. Uh, I started working nightlife almost immediately, but I couldn't get any jobs. Uh, I moved to Amsterdam when I was 18, and I started with flyering, just flyering anything I could. Uh, before I left Sweden, uh, growing up with my brother, we were kind of growing up in a rough immigrant-filled area. And at a very, very young age, you know, uh, our parents didn't make a lot of money, our family didn't make a lot of money. Uh, we were kind of on welfare. So we started already selling a lot. The first thing I learned how to do at the time when everyone was still using the big computers was to learn how to build a computer by myself. And I would go and buy, buy the parts cheap, and I would put it together, and I would sell it to someone else for just a little bit more, and I would make a little bit. And then me and my brother found out that, you know, there's this boat, this cruise that goes from Stockholm, we lived very close to Stockholm, to Estonia. And it only cost 15 euros. And you spent 24 hours, and they didn't have a lot of ID check on these boats. So at the age of 14 or 15, we started jumping these boats, going to Estonia. We had a hockey bag with us, and we would buy a shit ton of vodka like 50 CL plastic bottles of vodka, and we would take it back to Sweden. In Sweden, it was really hard to uh, buy alcohol. You have to go to these. It's monopolized by the government. And we, uh, we would sell it to all our friends. So really, I started selling booze at the age of 14, 15. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I did a lot of different things like this. Uh, I worked with selling with and uh, throughout my summers when we were going to high school, I worked with a lot of different selling, but then I left all that and got into nightlife at the age of 18. But I, I think that I always had it in me, that whole business side of things, but I got into flyering, flyering throughout nightlife in Amsterdam. Um, we did flyering for like a pub crawl. One of the bars needed a staff member, and I picked it up. Like almost all bartender stories, you know, worked for a year or so as a bar back, worked my way up. Uh, I actually did not work with cocktails for the first five years of my nightlife and bartending career, but I worked more in bars that was more about the people, more about the regulars, and more about light and music. Uh, and then uh, I lived in Amsterdam, did that. I lived in India, and I lived in Thailand and I worked in bars there. And I eventually moved up to Norway, and I worked in Himcook, which Monica worked in. Uh, and I worked there, and there I started with uh, cocktails. I started learning a bit more about cocktails. I think it was very easy for me to learn about cocktails, because I had already spent so many years trying to learn about every other aspect of the bar. So when you come in and you try to learn about cocktails together with light and music and people and service, there's a much broader thing to learn. But it went very fast. Uh, after that, I worked in another cocktail bar in Norway. And then I entered my first cocktail competition. This was in end of 2015. I entered Bacardi Legacy. And Bacardi Legacy spoke to me because they had a different side of the competition. They had the marketing side. I thought this was going to be the hardest part of it. I had been so much into bartending throughout all this time. And as I entered uh, and as we started with the marketing, I noticed how fun it was because 
someone finally gave me a bunch of money and said, go and do your IDs. And it, I, I've always wanted to open my own bar ever since I started in the first bar in Amsterdam. That was always, you know, the romantic dream that we bartenders have about one day I'll open my own bar and it will be the best place in the universe and all that stuff. But I, I always wanted to do that. And basically uh, doing, that, doing that marketing part gave me a bit more confidence to go and do something on my own. Because someone gave me a bit of money and said, go and create your IDs and actually be practical and make them happen. Uh, it went really, really good. Uh, throughout that competition. Uh, I ended up on the top three in the world. Uh, and after I did that, I went back to Norway, packed up my stuff, and decided to move away from Norway. And I moved down to Barcelona with the idea of doing my own thing. When I came to Barcelona, it was really hard. Now, we don't speak the language in Barcelona. I had a little bit of money saved up and had this idea that I was going to open a bar in Barcelona. So the first thing I did was that I had to step out of the bar for the first time in about six years. I had to step out of the bar and not work for about a year. What I did is that I set up a massive Airbnb. A friend of mine had told me about this ID. We came to Barcelona. I put all my money into getting this five bedroom apartment. And I set up an Airbnb renting out the rooms. What this did for me as a bartender is that it gave me time and money. Now, the one thing we don't have as bartenders are those two things combined. Because if we have a lot of time, we'll spend all our money. We'll go to bars and restaurants and <laughs> wherever we want to go and drink fancy cocktails and do whatever. But it gave me the opportunity to get both time and money. The only thing I needed to do was clean some rooms and check the people in. And it would pay me, uh, I would pay for the rent and I would have a couple of thousand euros over to research and really plan my project. So as we were doing this, we were like, OK, so now we have a little bit of money. We, uh, between, we were a team of three people. And we said, OK, we have a little bit of money, but not so much. Uh, when we were looking on listings on different venues that was available to acquire as a bar, they were way too expensive. And we said, OK, we have to knock on doors. We have to go around. We have to look for bars that are not doing so well, and we have to knock on the doors and try to convince them to sell to us. As we were doing this, I tried to ride the wave of the legacy competition that I've made. So I created the brand Two Schmucks with no intention for this to actually be about our bar. And it was only about me and my partner. And we presented it to the brand like, all right, so we've created this concept. Uh, we want to do these takeovers in these different bars. And it's not only going to be about the drinks. It's going to be about the music. It's going to be about the atmosphere. We're going to do a complete takeover of the bar. And we'll use your portfolio if you pay for our trips and hotel. And it worked. They gave us, uh, we were supposed to do this for two, three months. And uh, it actually became a bit more popular than what I had expected. And we ended up doing it for four or five months. So that worked really well. We created a brand that we were kind of based on. And now all we needed was a venue. So we went around and we knocked on doors. And we knocked and knocked and knocked. It was around three, four months of having a whole bunch of business cards. I was back to flyering again. Having a whole bunch of business cards, knocking, go, going to bars, saying, hey, who's the owner? Do you guys want to sell? And finally, we hit gold. We kind of got to a place that used to be a taco place. It was owned by an Israeli fella who was an IT guy. And he had given the keys to his head chef to run the whole place. His head chef was a Mexican guy, I believe. Now, his head chef, I think, had drug problems. They had run the place into the ground. They were only supposed to take in 40 people. There was 120 people in the bar. They came into the kitchen one time, and the food that he was preparing was actually on the floor. And so this place got shut down. The rules in Barcelona, if you get shut down, is that you have to pay all your employees full wage for around five months. You usually get shut down for five months, unless you have good employees. If you have good employees, they'll tell you, no, it's OK. You don't have to pay me. If you have shit employees, they'll tell you, I want that money, right? However, this is, I, think, I believe this is an incentive for you to sell your license. Because if you sell your license, if you sell your place to someone else, 
you get released from all that. The business is sold and the business doesn't exist, therefore it doesn't have to pay its employees. So this guy wanted to sell this place as soon as possible. Now we luckily were knocking on his door within 24 hours of this shutting down because we got a tip from one of his neighbors where we were regulars at the bar. And so we went there as soon as we could, knocked on the door and we were like, hey, we heard you wanna sell. He was shocked. He was like, how the hell did you know? Uh, I was like, yeah, no, this, like your neighbor just told us about it. And he was selling us the place for half the market price. Now half the market price was still way too much for us because we got the bar in an amazing area called the Raval, representing my hood, <laughs> uh, in this amazing area. And it's a very, very popular street. It's a very, very, very up and coming kind of place, much like, uh, uh, much like Krausberg here in Berlin. It's a kind of going to it is this rough area that's filled with artists, independent businesses, going to it is tiny gentrification thing. So it's a very kind of desired area right now. <coughs> And so all the money we had could not pay this price that we needed to get this license, which by the way, it was 120,000 euros. Between me and the two other guys, we had maybe around 40,000 euros that we had saved up to all our work and to everything. And we were getting a little bit of money through the Airbnb, but yeah. And, uh, and so we went to the bank. We had a business plan. We had one guy that had worked in, in, in Spain for quite a while. Uh, and we had a business plan and we had everything and uh, the bank had set up these loans for newly starting businesses uh, of around 50,000 euros. So we would have 90,000, it would be closer to the 120. We figured the last 30, we can source it from somewhere. Uh, the people at the bank in Spain work extremely slow. So, uh, but, but the guy was really friendly with us and he really liked us and so he waited and so it took us around two and a half months to get this loan and he waited from that time for us to get the money because this IT guy from Israel he had been he had been fooled around by his head chef he had been tricked by a lot of different Spanish people and tricked out of money and so when he saw us coming from another country young guys wanting to start a business he was really kind of friendly with us and he really wanted us to have his business now the bank kept telling us, oh, this is such a good business plan. This is such a good thing. We did all our projections. We did everything right. I studied the whole thing. I was studying a bit of how Jörg was doing his numbers. I was studying a bit of how Sven Roger Almaning was doing his projections. If you don't know about that, that's also really good information. And basically, they kept reassuring us, oh, you're going to get it. You're definitely going to get it. You're definitely going to get it. It's going to take time. And then the the news came and we didn't get it. We didn't get any money from the bank. And this had now been around a six, seven, eight month process. We had put so much time and energy into this and we were just about losing it. And by the way, when I did the two schmucks on tour, when we were traveling around, we actually lied to the brand and we said, we already have a bar and this is gonna be the concept of the bar. And we kind of just told them, no, no, this is happening. I was inspired by Bill Gates in Silicon Valley when he went to IBM and he said, I already have the computer and he didn't have shit. And it was the same thing that we told the brand. We were like, oh no, we already have the bar, we already have everything. Uh, and then afterwards we told, all right, now we just have to get a bar. So we didn't get the money. You want a little water? Yeah, <laughs> a little healthy water. <laughs> and so and so we didn't get the money uh, and I still remember that day very 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 clear because when we got the information I got it over a phone call and I was walking from one place to another and I kind of just stopped and it was, it, was, it was really, really devastating because we had poured so much into this right now. The brand was doing stronger than ever. It was, it was going at an upwards trajectory and everything was moving so well. We were gonna get this bar and then this happened. And I still don't forget it because I was walking home, I was listening to Bob Dylan and I was listening to It's All Right Ma, I'm Only Bleeding. And he was singing the song, either be busy born or be busy dying. And I remember thinking, fuck that, I'm not giving up on this venue. 
I need to get it. We have gotten so much into it. Oh, and by the way, we had already paid down a deposit of 10,000 euros. That's why he waited as well. <laughs> he didn't just wait because he liked this. We had already also paid him a 10,000 euro deposit, which, because the bank didn't come through, we were going to lose 10,000 euros. And uh, for the next venue that we would have to take, we would have 10,000 euros less. So it was a lot of money for us. We're bartenders, and you know we're not we're not someone that can go like ah, so I lost ten grand, whatever. Let's just go somewhere else. So this was really, really, really devastating. Everything we had worked for was just gonna go into the crapper because of the bank's promises to us. Because the bank promised that to us, we put down the money and so on. So what I did is that. And this is what I want to talk to you about today as well, about the marketing, about the different things, and about storytelling. So what I did is that I booked a meeting with this guy. And I just told him my whole story. And I said, look, this is what we've been doing. This is what I've been doing with my life. This is why we came here to Barcelona. This is why we were going to open this. The bank let us down. We only have 40,000 euros. I'm sorry. but." If you give us your business for 40,000 euros, then I promise you that the rest of the 80,000 euros will pay you five to 10 every month and on like, a, on like a set contract that will pay it off. The majority of people selling their business would have said no. He also had other buyers from Norway, Norway Spanish people, and they were there ready to buy his business. And they offered more than us because when, uh, when he said, no, I'm selling it to these guys, they offered him around 7,500 euros more. 7,500 euros is a lot, even though you think about 120,000. When someone says, I'll give you 127,500, it's a lot of money. But he had bad experience with the Spanish people because they had fooled him on an occasion or two. And so after we told him our, his, uh, our story, after we told him our plan, after we told him, look, we can't pay for this, but this is what we can do, and it's all we can do, but I hope you can understand. And he said, let me think about it. He went home, and he came back the next day, and he, had, he was an IT guy, so he had pushed in my name into Google and into YouTube, and he had seen one of the videos that we had made at one point throughout our bartending or whether it was a competition. I don't know which video he saw. He just saw he had seen a video of me on YouTube with the bartending. And he shook my hand that day. He said, OK. He said, let's do it. And we, this was just unbelievable for me because it had gone from us kind of about to lose everything to us doing it simply because we put in the time to go out and knock on the doors. We put in, we had built a way for us to not be so dependent on uh, working full time throughout the Airbnb. And simply because we told them our story exactly how it was. So that's how we got the bar, which is right now called Two Schmucks. We're still paying off this guy from month to month. We just opened at the beginning of August, but it's going really well. Much like telling him the story when a lot of our guests come in, we tell them the story about how we're going to create a bar. Now, we couldn't afford their innovation, right? Because, I mean, we were already out of, like, we gave all our money to him. We could barely afford the beginning booze when we were going to open. Like, we could barely afford to buy in some booze because beginning stock will cost you a couple of thousand euros. So we did like this. Uh, we raised around 2,000 euros, and we built the whole bar ourselves. We went to the wood shop and bought some wood. We found a friend who had some good tools, and we borrowed his tools. And we did as much DIY as we could. Our lamps are made of wood plates that we put on the wall with a regular lamp behind it. We went to the wood shop and we found this cheap wood that was naturally colored, kind of like this, uh, but it was kind of dark green. Uh, there, there used to be a step in the bar and we were going to take this step out with a sledgehammer, but we found out that there was marbles on the step. So we took a crowbar, we popped up the marble, and in our 2,000 euro bar, we have a marble bar tub. So we did a lot of these kind of different ways of, we were looking for different, uh, we were looking and looking and looking for different distributors of booze that could take money at the end of the month. Our business was very new, but we were like, will you take it? And if you ask any business owner or operator, this is the most stupid way to run, <laughs> start a business. You should always have so much more extra money in case of any emergencies. But we were determined we really wanted this. We were three 
kind of bar people, industry people that just want to open their own bar and we were really determined on not doing it with investors. You see, the way we built our team is that everyone has a specific task in the team and at no point do we want to bring someone in that is not part of this task force, so to speak. Uh, and so the first weeks were rough, but you know, we, uh, we need to raise a certain amount of money uh, to get to a certain point, and you realize a lot of things after the first day you open your business. You realize that a quiet day is not just a chill day at the bar. A quiet day means that your business is not doing as well as you thought it would be. It means that you have all these bills that you have to pay, and you have to find different creative ways of getting them in. Luckily, uh, the area that we were in were really great. Uh, we started, you know, people kept coming in, and we told them a story about how we built the whole bar ourselves, how, how about we're gonna renovate it in eight or nine months, and we're gonna raise up the money uh, to having this bar, and we just kept telling everyone our story. And within the first months, we've had so many regulars that have started to come back to our bar five, six, or seven times already within two months. And we were so happy about this, and we still keep doing it today. We still keep telling them why we do things. We still keep telling them about us, about our story, and give them experience why they, when, they, when they come to our bar. And it's, I think, part of what has made it really, really well. The business is going right now on an upward trajectory. We're making more and more. We're actually making enough so we can hire some people right now which will help us a lot because we've been working uh, so much uh, last month and we will for the next couple of months. And uh, we're right now in a place where we can see ourselves having the money done by around January or February to do the renovation and the actual bar that we wanted to do from the beginning. So I'm really happy about how it went. And so, now that you guys have that story about how we got the bar, I want to just speak quickly about the points that helped me create this bar and that we try to enforce within our team every day, uh, which right now consists of three people, but we're slowly kind of working on expanding that to a much, much uh, bigger uh, kind of thing. And by the way, the Two Schmucks brand, it will only, it will only be there until uh, uh, yeah, February or March when we do the renovation, and then we're going to do a new concept with a new bar. <coughs> And the idea is that Two Schmucks will be the company that me and my friend founded that will have started this bar. And from Two Schmucks, we can go and start other things, either products, venues. It will be our brand that will have created this second concept. So it, 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 it is an idea of kind of... <laughs> We've talked about this before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's, uh, so it's, yeah. Also, inspired, very much inspired by this guy. So, also, it's kind of like, uh, you know, we have our eyes set on creating some different products. We have our eyes set on importing a lot of different things to Barcelona that are not there yet. But there's a saying in Spain, which means the idea, which is day by day, and we're just working on it uh, day by day. And uh, because our bar was very kind of empty-ish in the beginning, we were like, why don't we do it into art, art exhibition thing? We can get in some more people. Why don't we do maybe, you know, DJs or live performances, we'll get some more people. And then we contacted some really good bartender friends and we said, do you guys want to come and do a takeover? The only thing we required was that you were not only come, gonna come and do drinks. Because my background in bars was a lot within regular bars and I think 20% of it, the last 20% has been within cocktails. So I was very determined to say that you have to come down and you have to bring your own music, you have to bring your own changes to the space, your own atmosphere. And so we targeted people with a very kind of unique or different way of doing things. And we said, we asked them if they wanted to come down. So we're getting, for example, El Copitas from St. Petersburg. They have a very peculiar bar because it's like one big rectangle or table. And the bartender is at the top of the table, like a dining table. And the people are just sitting on both sides. And so we're gonna build that rectangular table inside of the bar and that's where they're gonna do their drinks. Broken Shaker from Miami, we're talking with them about them coming down. Their bar is more like a pool party in a, in a, in a, in a hostel. And we're actually gonna put in a kiddie pool inside of the bar, I'll see how that will work out. But we're actually gonna put in a kiddie pool. So we really want to bring a kind of different form of escapism, we really want to bring a we really want our regulars to come in there and go like, holy fuck, what just happened to this place? So we, we really wanted to do that. So it would be a bit more like a, 
because we were thinking in the lines of art exhibition, and then we were thinking about bartending, and then we were like, okay, so if we can get them to change the space, that would be really cool. And because we still have all the tools and everything, and we've learned how to build a bar, we can easily build things for them, or rebuild things, or redo the different things. So, on to my first point. Where's the sip of? Of what? Of water, juniper water. One of the main things that I think a lot of businesses are not thinking about when they start off or when, they, when, they, uh, when they're about to embark on whatever they want to do is why. Uh, I don't think a lot of people ask this question enough to themselves. I think if you ask a lot of businesses or bar owners or whatever why they do the things they do, they often will go like, you know, I want to run a bar or, you know, making money. By the way, making money is a consequence of what you do. It's not, it's not why you do things. And it's a very, very funny question for me because a lot of people, when they speak about what they do, uh, they want to speak about how they do things and this is what we're doing and this is what we're doing. But there's a different change of mindset when you think about why you want to do the things you do. And it kind of, like, we're, we're, we're at a spot where we're working maybe, you know, 100 hours plus uh, a week and we're working our asses off. And the only thing that's kind of fueling this, the only thing that's kind of making us go forward is our like, ability to understand why we want to do the things we do. Is that we understand that we have this kind of spirit where we want to create a bar, we want to be able to create our brand, uh, we want to make a difference. One of the reasons why I want to make a bar is that I feel that I want to I feel that I want to create a complete package bar. We want to focus just as much on beer and wine as we focus on cocktails. We just want to create something that is that will kind of maybe maybe give 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 a different perspective on what a bar could be, uh, whether it's serving cocktails or whether it's the atmosphere or whether or how the seating is being taken care of. But I think a lot of people do not think enough about why they want to do something. And sometimes you can be a bartender and it can be easy to romanticize about building your own bar and you have to ask yourself, why do you want to have your own bar? Not all bartenders are good bar managers. Not all bar managers are good bar owners. Not all, you know, it's, it just kind of goes on and on and on. And you have to just ask yourself, why do you want to do what you're about to do? Whether it's starting a brand, whether it's starting uh, making a product, selling, uh, you know, if you see that something is trendy, uh, basil soda. <laughs> uh, why, do, sorry, <laughs> why, uh, why, why do you want to start this? Why do you want to do it? Why do you feel that there's something behind this? There's a, there's, there's a lot of emphasis, I think, on that question. The second part I want to uh, speak about is about being very, very self-aware. I think it's a thing that Monica spoke about as well with you guys, and it's about knowing who you are. When we set out to create the brand Two Schmucks, I mean, before I worked in Himco, before I worked in all these different bars, I've worked in, I worked in bars in Thailand where you know we didn't wear shoes because there was sand behind the bar, and I worked in uh, in Amsterdam. It was such a high volume place that sold six euro drinks and took fifteen thousand a night on three bartenders. Uh, I've worked in nightclubs. I've worked in all these different places, and I think it's very important to be self aware of who you are when you go out to create your brand. If you look at if you look at some if you look at some bars and some bartenders that are the ambassadors of these bars, if you look at, for example, I'm just gonna give out some really popular places because I think most people know them. If you look at places like American Bar at the Savoy, if you look at places like, like uh, Dead Rabbit, if you look at these places and you look at their bartenders and then you look at them outside their bars, you know, you look at Jack O'Shaughnessy and you look at Declan or Eric Lorenz, they're kind of a living embodiment of their brand. They are their brand. They're, they're like, like Jack and Sean, those Irish guys outside the bar as well as the inside. You can always see them being working in an Irish pub or a, like a cocktail bar. You meet, you know, Eric or Declan or whatever outside and they have that kind of, you know, that kind of politeness and so and the, the kind of style of the American bar all the time outside. And I think that if you want to create a bar and be very easy with it, you have to be able to create kind of a, a brand and a bar that is around who you are. If, you know, speakeasy cocktail bars are super popular, but that's not who you are, you're gonna have a very challenging time 
bringing your speakeasy cocktail bar to life, but it will be so much easier if you make the brand or the concept around who you are, because the only thing you have to do is that you have to wake up and be yourself, and you will be your brand. So when we created Two Schmucks, that's how we saw ourselves. We were just two schmucks and we were just really looking into like, who are we? Uh, we're kind of easy going. I don't put a lot of emphasis on, you know, some things and I like to dress the way I do right now in the bar. Sometimes I wear shorts and flip flops, uh, but it's just with the brand about like what we're doing because it's kind of making us become more self-aware within our brand and create what we want to create. And by the way, Nowadays, I think, this was taken out of a book that I really, really love that I think everyone should read if you're interested in this. Um, nowadays, there are so many, so many cocktail bars and it's rising and rising and becoming so, so much more and more and more. Uh, and to the outside world, to people that are not in the, in the industry, more often than not, we're all kind of the same for them. You know, it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's another cocktail bar, it's another thing. And it's becoming more, more and more challenging to differentiate yourself. It's becoming more and more challenging to kind of raise up your hand and go like, hey, look at us. But if you understand your why, and if you understand who you are, and you just have to be who you are within your brand, you will never have that challenge of differentiating yourself because you just are who you are, and that's it. It's only, it's only the people, I believe, that does not understand their why, that does not understand their self-awareness, that wakes up every day and go like, oh man, how can we be different? Oh man, how can we be different? If you want to be different, you just have to find the most pure form of yourself, and you just have to be that. And that's a belief that we always try to put into our bar when we do the menus, when we choose the products, uh, do we want to serve this? Is this something that we like to do? One of the things on my menu that I have, we do, we, do, uh, we do change the menu every month. We have signatures and we have classics and we use a lot of different methods and try to do amazing cocktails. But we also have Boilermakers on our menu because I love to drink Boilermakers. <laughs> More often than not in bars, I drink a beer and a shot. That's just what I like. I try cocktails if I'm in a nice cocktail bar, but a lot of times I drink a beer and a shot and so we have it on our menu. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't put there with the idea of, you know, making something different. It was put there with the idea of, well, what do we, who are we? And, you know, both me and Ahmed, my partner, we like to drink uh, Boilermakers, Bear in a Shot, and we were like, okay, so we're putting it on. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback from some people. We don't really judge them when people come in and just want a beer. Like some people, are, sometimes our friends go like, sorry, man, sorry, can I just get a beer? And we're really on the point, like, please don't be sorry about that. Like, if you want a beer, have a beer. That's okay. If you want to have some wine, have some wine. That's also okay. Because I want to, I want to serve you more as a person rather than only focus on one aspect of what it is that we do on, on liquids. And then I want to just quickly touch storytelling today, which has helped us so much, mainly on social media. I'm a massive fan of Jörg and how he does his storytelling through social media. Uh, and I think there is a massive misconception that sometimes happens when people try to start market their place to social media. I believe that today the bullshit radar on all of us is so high. We can, we can smell it a mile away. When something is not real, we can just tell. You know, the top comment on one of those things are always fake or on those YouTube videos or whatever, but we can just tell when something is just bullshit. And this is, this is a thing we did kind of as an experiment to see which one of them would get a lot more feedback, a uh, different amount of followers, and what we would do. So basically, we put up two different styles of posts around the same drink. It was a clarified drink uh, that we call the curry colada. It's kind of made with, uh, it's a pina colada made with madras curry, ginger, a lot of different spices, peanut butter. Uh, and we put up a very beautiful picture, kind of a clickbait picture on it. And then we put up uh, two different stories and so on, on Facebook about how we made this stuff. Now the massive difference between these two is that that one got a good amount of likes, some comments, wow, this is cool, this is nice, so on and so forth. That one had kind of made our, made our Instagram account get so many messages, private messages, asking us about the technique, asking us to further go into it. We gave, in that one, we gave people value. 
We made people want to follow us for a reason. Same way well, that when Jörg speaks about his business and how they're counting this or how they're doing that, he gives you guys value. So you go follow this, follow that, get his newsletter, and you do that because he gave you value today, he'll probably give you value tomorrow. And you might not get as many likes, but you'll get a more kind of trusting uh, form of followers on your social media. You get people that want to follow you for what you do. They think what you do is interesting. And so I believe that when it comes to social media, it's a lot more interesting to do raw, uncut, unfiltered kind of stuff. You have the device right in your phone. Instead of paying a, a company to make these amazing videos and these amazing pictures of your cocktails, do a selfie video when you're backstage you know, uh, doing, uh, doing, doing the prep. Show people how you do the things you do. And if you think that, oh, okay, well, I mean, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to share my recipe for this, or I don't want to share my recipe for that, you can find everything online right now, or in books, or whatever, and people will find it if they want to. But if you share it, and you show people how to do it, you claim it. <coughs> You know, you go like this is this is this is how we do this. This is the technique. This is the this is the thing. You give value to the people, and in return, they kind of they kind of appreciate you, and they follow you, and your social media accounts will get a better reach. Uh, your marketing will become better, and it will kind of change the game you're playing when you're in social media. So it's basically a very simple thing of just just basically understanding that you just give people value throughout your social media. Don't just do the pretty stuff, the fancy stuff. And then the team that I want to speak about quickly, I think I touched this just quickly before. We were really set on not having investors to the point that we were going to lose 10,000 euros. Uh, and we still didn't go to try to get any investors because it, it's just this idea of mine that when when we were going to open the bar, everyone in the team was going to have a certain kind of part. So this is us three. Uh, by the way, that runs the thing. That's the only picture I could find of James. Uh, he doesn't like to be in the, he's a bit more in the background. He barely uses his Facebook or anything like that. But anyway, so Ahmed, our guy up to, there to the left, he, he does everything photography and film. Right now, we're actually working on a documentary that we're doing for Cocktails for You. This documentary is going to be a very kind of raw footage thing of us trying to open a bar. The plot is very simple. Three bartenders with almost no money are trying to open a bar in a country where they don't speak the language. Which, I mean, we speak bar Spanish now. We can take orders and stuff, but yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, he, also, he also is one of the best guys that I know when it comes to coffee and beer, which are going to be something that we're going to focus on a lot. I believe that you know you have your business. We are allowed to open from 6 a.m. to 3:30 a.m. on a license, and so uh, we're gonna have a strong, strong, strong daytime program. A lot of day drinking, a lot of <laughs> that kind of stuff at daytime, and then uh, and we. I want to do great coffee. I want to do great beer as well in the same bar. Uh, we got me over there. I work a lot more with marketing. I take care of the social media, the events. I work with the people. I get out here, come here to shows. Maybe try to speak with some people and so tell everyone about us, about our story. And then we have James, uh, which uh, James is kind of, uh, he's been in Barcelona a bit longer and he kind of understands business, uh, uh, has a lawyer, has an accountant. He takes care of all the accounting. He takes care of a lot of the paperwork. Um, he takes care about the different rules and so on. And he's also, his hobby is building stuff. He just likes creating stuff. He used to work with creating 3D things before everyone could do that in their own houses. Uh, so, I mean, for a hobby that he does, he goes and builds movie stages. So I tell him we need to build a toilet that's going to explode, and he just builds it for them. So uh, through his help, we were able to build a bar as well. Uh, and he's, he's kind of a bit more in the background, but he's go going to be taking care. When we get staff members, he's going to have a much bigger role in being able to take care of them and take care of everything that we need for them. Uh, and this is why uh, this is one of the things that I believe is also like very very detrimental uh, because we're putting in a lot of hard work. We're putting in so many hours, and uh, yes, we might not we might not have our ROI, our kind of investment back 
until maybe a year and a half, two years. But guess what, when we do, uh, we're also applying for a new license that's worth so much more. When we do, our bar is gonna be worth so much more. And uh, owning uh, 50 or 60% of that as a business move is gonna be a lot smarter. If five years goes by, and we know that our area is going through some gentrification. If five years goes by and we decide that, hey, I wanna do something else now, and we've put in five years into this business, it'd be, it, 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 it would suck for me to sell that place and only have 10 or 20% because I chose to have some investor because I didn't want to do the hard work. I had done all the hard work before for other bars, so why wouldn't I do it for myself? And so it was a really kind of move for us that yes, it's gonna suck, we don't have any employees, it's only me and Ahmed working right now on 30 people. Fridays and Saturdays are tough, but we kind of manage, kind of. Uh, and, and so it was, it was really important for us that we were gonna go in, we were gonna do it, and everyone is gonna have a part in the business. No one will be a partner if they just want to, all right, this is the money, there you go. And the last thing is a thing by the author Simon Sinek. Uh, I don't know if any people know it here, but it's about game theory. And this is one of the main thing when it comes to awards, when it comes to competition, when it comes to running your business, because a lot of people get kind of interested in the wrong things. A lot of people get interested in maybe only making a bar to win some awards, which don't get me wrong, from an entrepreneurial point of view, winning an award is a lot more of, for example, if you get best new opening in whatever kind of category, yes, you'll get a lot of maybe consulting jobs for some new opening hotels, because if you can, you can translate whatever you just won into money, if you look at it that way, or into more business opportunities or whatever you want to think about. But still, game theory should, uh, suggests that there are two different games that we play, right? There's a finite game, which is a set game, which it has a number amount of players, which has a number amount of minutes and time, which is like football. When the game finishes, it's finished, nothing more, nothing less, and that's it. And then there's another game which applies more to business, which is the infinite game. The infinite game is more like there's not a certain amount of players. Players can just come in and out. There's not a certain amount of rules. Rules change all the time. And you never play to win. You play to keep going. These are the differences between these two games. Now, if, 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 if two players play the same game, the finite game, then they understand there's rules, there's players. For example, if two players are, if two bartenders are in a competition, they get it. Uh, and if two players are in the infinite game against each other, that's fine as well. But what happens is that some of us bartenders specifically go into doing some things and we're playing the finite game, we're playing the game with set rules, and we're playing against a player who's playing the infinite game which is what you should have for your business. Playing the infinite game is what a business should be run by. But some businesses are around to play the finite game. And so it goes, it, goes, it goes very differently when you are just playing to win something, whereas when you're playing on a different way to kind of just keep on going. I think that when it comes to either entering, uh, whatever, entering a competition, being a bartender, opening a bar, doing anything, you need to ask yourself which game you're playing and you need to really look into it. There's a lot of things we do on the infinite kind of scale to help support our bar, to help support our business. And what happens is that when you play, when you play the finite game, you look to the left and you look to the right. And you look at your competitors, what's he doing? What am I gonna do to be better? You know, because you're playing against them. Whereas when you play the infinite game, you're playing against yourself. Because you just want to keep going. And the game only finishes when you drop out. So what did I do yesterday? What am I gonna do better today? That's the infinite game. And if people are playing the finite game next to you, they'll get pissed off at you because they will not understand like, how you just like, keep going and going and going. But I think it's very kind of important uh, to, to, to think about that. And so a couple of things that we're doing to, uh, <coughs> to kind of think about a long term is that first of all, we're really promoting our city and we're really promoting our community, as you can see. <laughs> we're really promoting our neighborhood because it is a still an up-and-coming neighborhood in the Raval, but whenever we get the chance to talk about it to people, we talk about the growth in bars and cafes and nice restaurants. 
But there's one project that we specifically have that's very, very interesting. I want to take this example to give it to you guys. Uh, and I got this from Danny Meyer setting the table. And uh, he was speaking about them building a park outside their restaurant because this park became so much more popular and they were doing volunteer work and so on there. So we're in a very narrow street in Barcelona, but this street is open for cars, right? There was a rumor that the street might be closing down for cars. And we put in a lot of effort to look into this. And we're now speaking with a lawyer about maybe being able to draft up anything to kind of lobby this cause to shut down this road. Because this will happen if we shut down the road. We, we're doing some different petitions from the different businesses on the streets, from the people that live there. This is what happens if we shut down the road. If we shut down the road, we get more foot traffic. If we get more foot traffic, we get more business. If we shut down the road, we're allowed to have a terrace. If we have a terrace, we can pay the tax man some tax and he will be happy. And I don't know if you've been to Barcelona, but if you have a terrace, it's very hard having that thing empty. We'll have a terrace of 16 people that will have open for around 16 hours a day. And we understand that we will, we will always have a certain amount of income that will always be there for the bar, whether it's going good or bad. Not only us, but every other bar, restaurant, and cafe on that street will have that same terrace. And so there's a lot of, and so we're putting in so much effort to try to make this happen. And it's kind of a thing that you know might not happen for two, three, four, or five years. But also, if that happens, and then let's say five, 10, or 15, or whatever years goes by, and we decide to sell this business, maybe do something else, it will also go up and worth so much more. So it's kind of, it's kind of uh, the way we think about certain things. This is just one of the examples. But we really want to look at playing an infinite game. We really want to look to just keep going and going and going. And I think it's important to think about things like this. So, um, I hope this gave you a little bit of information. I hope sharing my story gave you a little bit of kind of insight in what we do and how we run our things. Uh, if you guys want to contact me, that's my Facebook and my Instagram, and I ha hope this gave something. By the way, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. I'm from Barcelona. So yes, sir. I'm working in London now, but a few years I wanted to come back. Cool. Uh, how do you see the city? How do you see the bartending? The how, what do you feel? Because I see very clever your idea that uh, you are uh, serving liquids. You are, not, uh, you are not focusing one side that can be just cocktails in order to you are, uh, if, not, if not you are uh, focusing to serve what the customer can request. No? What mm -hmm. do you think about uh, how can add improve Barcelona that way? Because it's very difficult. Well, I think that one thing that happens when the community changes is that Barcelona has long only had businesses that's been opened by investors. And uh, it changes when bartenders opens bars, when baristas open cafes, when chefs opens restaurants. That's when you get the passionate, good quality things. And after they do that, when an investor comes, an investor will pay someone to do some market research. And so the market researcher will come and they'll go, what's, what's the best bar around here? What's our competition or whatever? And they'll go, well, here's, the, well, here's, here's what the quality is at. Because now there's a lot of bartender-owned bars. And so the investor will hire consultants to try to get people that can match that quality, right? So what's happening in Barcelona, the revolution, if you want to call it, is that uh, bartenders are finally opening their own places. Uh, we do focus on liquids, but we focus, we, the four things we're going to mainly be focusing on is wine, coffee, beer, and cocktails. Because we want to be able to offer, uh, we don't, we don't, we really want to define ourselves as a cocktail bar, we want to define ourselves as a bar. And we want to offer an ultimate form of escapism as a bar and make you comfortable. So whatever you're thinking about wine, we want to have an amazing selection of wine, amazing selection of beer, uh, specifically chosen by us. Uh, amazing coffee, so on and so forth. But I believe that Barcelona is changing because of that reason. There's only maybe a handful, 100% uh, bartender-owned bars. Uh, right now in Barcelona, not more than five, I believe, that I know of. Uh, we're one of them. I know a couple of other bars. They're also, I love them. They're also absolutely amazing. Uh, having that said, there's also a lot of amazing bars in Barcelona that's open and run by investors and so on. But um, it's changing. And I think when it changes, the standard goes up and up and up. There's also other things like happening. So House just opened in Barcelona. The Edition, uh, who's got the punch room and so in London, they're also opening in Barcelona in February. And you know, with these businesses coming in, the city kind of goes up. And we, we love to promote our city. I moved there for a reason. And every chance I get, I want to get people to come and visit Barcelona. I will do your work. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So. Well, I thank you. Say, I don't know if you mind, we can go out and enjoy a last drink or two. Maybe yeah. three. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys.